Good morning, everybody. This is Pastor Jan with Pastor Mike Kosminski from Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship. Uh, yes, we are Zooming from our home and um, during this time. And uh, first, before I, I go on and share, I just want to say thank you um, to the worship team. It just felt the Holy Spirit really moving today. It was really anointed. I also want to um, shout out a happy birthday to my granddaughter, Claire, who is 10 today. Happy birthday, Claire. And uh, then I'm going to open in prayer and uh, share. Dear Lord, we thank you today. We thank you in every day, especially today, Dor. Lord, because you said it's the day of rest, and we're going to focus on you today, if we can, Lord willing. Lord, bless everyone in our congregation, anyone that's watching. Lord, just let your Holy Spirit flow. That's what I'm looking for is the Holy Spirit flow to reach every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, I want to start with um, uh, reviewing some of my past weeks. I've made some blunders. Um, the week I shared about Martin Luther King Jr., I said he gave a speech on uh, 1968, and it was actually 1963. And the other thing I said was in the following week was when I talked about the Good Samaritan, and I talked about I think I said Jesus was a Muslim, and I didn't mean to ever say that. I meant Jesus was um, the two people that passed the injured man were Christians, and they, they lost their opportunity. But the third one that was not a Christian, who knows, you can fill in the blank um, what kind of person that was, um, they stepped up. And I think the point I was trying to make was that we need to step up. We, we need to take the opportunity first. We need to take the opportunity if we missed it first and second and not blow our opportunities to help others. So, sorry about that. Okay, um, we are going to be looking at Psalm 97 today. I'm really excited about this psalm. I love this psalm. And um, I noticed um, I have a word written in orange above it that says the kingship. So now we're entering psalms that, um, in my view, are exciting, and they, um, and I can get them. I can understand them without having to have an interpretation from my husband. But here we go, Psalm ninety-seven. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitudes of islands be glad. In other words. Let everybody, Jews and Gentiles, all celebrate that the Lord reigns. And I'm really praying that in our world, we will see that one day. I don't know when, but I'm really praying for that. Cloud and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. You know, we've talked about building the house on the rock. Well, the rock has to be righteousness and justice. That's telling you what the rock, part of what the rock is. A fire goes before him and burns up his enemies round about him. His lightnings light the world. You can't hide lightning. When lightning is in the air, it is phenomenal. And God causes it. Man is not causing that lightning. We might make fireworks that are spectacular, but nobody can make lightning. Only God. And yes, you know, I know someone's probably thinking, well, you know, he, he's not up there pressing a button. No, and there are things that go on in our atmosphere that cause the lightning. But I believe when the final show comes, it's going to be God's fireworks. It's going to be lightning. And it, he will be pressing buttons. So as lightnings light the world, the earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. Uh, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. The heavens declare his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. Put your finger in there, and you can listen or turn with me to Exodus 19, verse 16. Now, that passage reminded me of Moses. It reminded me when Moses went up the mountain. And so I looked it up. 
19, Exodus 19, 16, then it came to pass on the third day. Isn't that interesting? On the third day, in the morning, that there were thunderings and lightnings. Visible proof that God was there. And a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud. So that all the people who were in the camp trembled. You know, when that day comes, and when we see lightning and the whole earth sees it, and we hear thunder and the whole earth hears it, will we be trembling? And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Zion was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long, became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. And then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. So I see that in that passage of Psalm 97, 2 through 6. Let all be put to shame who serve carved images, who boast of idols. Worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and is glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, Lord, are most high above all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. And I just want to share a real short little story here. I believe that God has set our feet on a path, each one of us. And sometimes we don't really like the path we're on. Sometimes we think we should be in another path. We should be in another journey. We should be in another place. Now, every day, every day, multiple times a day, when my dog is walking down the hallway, he goes by one door. Now, the door is shut. He's not allowed in the room, but he thinks in his mind that it is full of treasures beyond belief, and he wants to get in that room. So every day when he walks by, he bumps the door with his butt. He bumps the door. Sometimes he gets lucky, and the door isn't latched, and it just flies open, and he runs in there, and he's like, woohoo, I hit the mother load. And you know what he gets usually? He'll get a piece of paper, a uh, my husband sometimes has business cards on his calendar. He'll grab one of those. He grabbed the other day one of my uh, cardboard uh, book slips of a series. It was empty. He grabbed it. He thought he really got something, and he rushes out. And we have to get it from him, make sure the door's shut. And this goes on and on. How many of us bump the door? How many of us keep trying? God has shut a door for us. He shut a door and we go by and bump it, thinking maybe it'll be open today. I don't know what your door is that is shut. But God has set your feet on a path. He has sent you, he sent you a light under your feet. He has sent you, he needs you where you are now. Trust me, he will let you know when it's time to move. But for now, we need to stop bumping the door. We need to stop saying, God, this is where I, I, I need to be. Think of Eve in this luscious, luscious garden. And yet, she bumped the door, didn't she? She was like, no, this isn't enough. I want more. And she bumped that door. And boy, did that blow up on her. Okay, so, you know, God is really coming after people about idols. And, you know, I don't know of anybody of you that have wooden idols or carved idols, but you may have other kind of idols. I know I can. I can fantasize and think about, whoa, maybe if I did this, I would be this or do this, and I can... And that's an idol. God wants us to rid ourselves of all idols in our lives. Verse 10, you who love the Lord hate evil. Well, that looks easy enough, doesn't it? It's so many times we are tempted. You know, I was thinking about the story of the Samaritan, the Good Samaritan. And those are obvious, obvious incidents of helping someone. 
But what about on a daily basis when we're not walking and somebody's hurt, we need to rescue them? What about those temptations when people are gossiping and we join in? Hating evil. Do we hate evil? And on our level, where we're at, do we really hate evil? Or we just engage in it too? He pursues the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. Light is shown for the righteous. I love that verse. If we really walk with God, walk after God, walk for God, he will light our path with righteousness and gladness for the upright in the heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. He is our king. He is our Lord of lords. I don't think I can add to this psalm. I don't think I can do any more, but I really think, I've read this quite a few times, and then with the worship we had today, it just went hand in hand. We need to praise his name. I was thinking today, I, I really should have put on every computer, everything I had to play the, the music that was sung in our church today to really get in my spirit worship. I need to go there with God. And this psalm opens that door. And when I think of Moses going up, I'm sure he was frightened, seeing this mountain, this huge mountain, and God's up there, and he can't even see God. It's it, first going up, it's all full of smoke and clouds, and who knows what's in there. For all he knew, he was walking to his death. He didn't know. And that's like with us sometimes. We need to trust God, don't we? We need to know that he shut doors in our lives for us to go in a certain direction. Right? And he's opened other doors. Maybe I don't like the door he's opened for me, but I'm still going to walk it. I'm going to walk it. So now we're going to partake in communion. And again, um, you know, it's really interesting. I spoke to two different people this weekend. Both are um, really, I don't want to say enjoying this time of seclusion, but they are absolutely making it a win-win. They're turning this depressing time into something glorious for them and the Lord. Um, one person told me that he's not watching the news anymore. He turns it off and he just reads the word and how uplifted he feels. Another person told me that God is, God, we have this time. And what a rich time. If you look at it, the glass half full, we can hide away with God. We don't, we don't have to say, no, I'm not going out today because it's just a given. I'm staying home because of COVID right now. But when I'm staying home, I'm with God. I'm reading the word. I'm, I'm talking to him. I'm asking for him to show me those gems, to show me those things where I need to change, to open doors and close doors and to lead me in the darkness to give me that light he says light is sown for the righteous and you know if we get light we will give light isn't that awesome that you can hand light to someone and i think we can in this hour but we need to go to the light source we need to use this time it may end tomorrow it might end in a month it might end in a year who knows but this is a valuable time for us to really get close to the lord so let's look at it in a positive light I know it's hard for some people um, to do that, but try it and see what happens. All right, so Lord, we're gonna right now take the bread and um, we are going to take the bread and thank you again so much for sacrificing your body for us, for giving freely, following um, the obedient command of your Father, following to the cross that was awful just awful we thank you lord that you didn't give up and you didn't turn back and you didn't say no and you didn't bump the door to see if there was another escape another route lord thank you so much for going on that path lord 
In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for the blood, Jesus. Thank you. For your blood. For your blood, dear God. Life is in your blood, Lord, and we thank you, Lord. When I looked outside today and I saw the snow, the whole earth was covered with white. And I thought of your righteousness covering us as the snow, Lord. Your blood covering us. What a miracle, Lord. Cover us in your blood, Lord Jesus. Cover us in your righteousness, Lord. Your foundation is righteousness, Lord. Lord, may we have a foundation of righteousness and justice in this hour, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you for your blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you, everybody, and um, don't bump the door. Don't bump the door. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. We're in uh, book four of the Psalms, but before we really tackle book four, uh, what I want to do today is really look at the prophetic significance, not simply of book four, but of the entire Psalter, of the entire book of Psalms. There's a, a transition that happens um, from book three to book four. Many theologians, Bible scholars, teachers, see a, a change from book three to book four. In fact, uh, many of them say that book four is the center of the Psalter, the center of the book of Psalms. And we really want to see and understand why that is the case. And to do that, we're going to go back and look at an overview of Psalms. Uh, we said that Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 are the heading of the entire book of Psalms. Psalm 1 and 2 um, state the beginning purpose of all of the book of the Psalms. Uh, we've said that the Psalms are put together in a specific order to reveal um, the specific purposes of God, uh, how the Lord establishes his kingdom purposes in the earth. Now, the thing that's very special about Psalms, Psalms is applicable both to the old covenant scriptures and the new covenant scriptures. It's, it's the book of worship for Israel and it's the book of worship for the church. There's something very central about Psalms. Like Christians get into this Old Testament theology, New Testament theology. Oh, that's Old Testament, not New Testament. And while there's certainly truth to that, we miss the point that we have a Bible that's Genesis through Revelation, not just Matthew through Revelation. And what we are looking for is a biblical theology. And this, this book that probably should be at the center of the Old Testament and the New Testament is Psalms. So it's, it's very significant. I know for our congregation, we've been going through the Psalms now for close to a year. We've been reading one Psalm a day. We've been studying it. We've been praying into it. We've been looking at it, its relationship to the, the other psalms that are around it. We've been looking at the whole book of the psalms, trying to understand God's purpose. So if, if we go, first of all, to Psalm 1 and then Psalm 2, 
We talked about this before, but I'm reviewing it. Uh, the Psalms in their final collection, the way they're, they're ordered, 1 through 150, have Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 at the start as a purpose statement for the entire Psalms. Psalm 1 says, the very first verse says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Blessed is the man who walks in righteousness. Psalms 1 says there that throughout the entire Psalms, there's this theme of righteousness and wickedness. We are to forsake wickedness and we are to embrace righteousness. And that that theme will be present through all the Psalms. Then Psalm 2, and notice neither Psalm 1 nor Psalm 2 are titled. You know, they don't have a superscription. It doesn't say, you know, who wrote it or for what purpose it's written. Psalm 2 then also says, in how are we going to establish righteousness and uh forsake wickedness, well, it's going to be through the kingship of the Lord, through the Lord's anointed Messiah, through the Lord's king. And now, if if you're a, a Hebrew reading Psalm 2, before Jesus has come, this is about a son of David is going to be established to bring forth righteousness and destroy wickedness. That's the Messiah, the anointed one. We know, and the Psalms begin to suggest that, uh, we'll see in book four, book three and book four in particular, the Psalms suggest that it's not going to be a human king who's going to establish God's kingdom and bring forth righteousness and, and break the power of wickedness. It's going to be a messianic king. It's going to be the Messiah. It's going to be the Lord Jesus. Psalm 2 says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Messiah, his anointed, the son of David. So it's speaking about the Davidic covenant, the covenant that the Lord made with David. And that covenant is seen particularly in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where the Lord promises to establish David's house and from his seed bring this anointed ruler who's going to bring Israel, the people of God, into the kingdom purposes of the Lord. Also, Psalm 89, which is the final psalm of book three, book three in the Psalms, describes perfectly this covenant that God made with David. There's a twist and a turn that takes place in Psalm 89, but it describes the same covenant that is in 2 Samuel chapter 7, and that is laid out here in the second psalm. Now notice, righteousness Establish wickedness broken, wickedness disestablished. And it's going to be through the Messiah, the king. But what is the chief opponent of the Lord's Messiah establishing righteousness in the earth? The nations, the peoples, the kings of the earth. Human political systems. Right, right off the bat, Psalms 2 tells us the overarching theme of God establishing his kingdom. Human kingdoms are against the kingdom of the Lord. They are one of the primary sources of wickedness. These kings say, let us burst their bonds apart and cast their cords away from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. The Lord then will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. No, I have a king. He's not going to be a ruler of any nation ever in human history. He's going to be the Messiah. He's going to be the Lord Jesus. He's going to be the king of kings and lord of lords. He's going to be the lion of the tribe of Judah. He and he alone, I will set him on Zion, the place where my presence, the mountain where my presence comes down, as Pastor Jan spoke of in Exodus 19, the Lord he comes to 
Sinai, but he eventually comes to Zion. I will tell the decree, the Lord said to me, you are my son, this day I've begotten you. Speaking of the Messiah, the Messiah is the Lord's son. The Messiah is the son of Yahweh. And the Lord declares for cosmic law, a law that, that, that determines the, the course of the entire universe. You are my son, this, this descendant of David. But he's not just simply there to establish Israel, and he's not just there to destroy the nations. He's actually there to, to bring all the nations of the earth under his kingship. Psalms said it. I mean, the, 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 it looked in the earlier parts of Psalms that the way God establishes his kingdom is through Israel and Judah, through God's people. But, but it, it really, it's, it's greatly expanded particularly when we get to book four and we move into book five of the Psalms. We're, we're in book one right now. It's expanded to say this king is going to be the king of all the nations of the earth, not just Israel, not just the church, but all the nations of the earth. God's view is to bring all the nations of the earth under his kingship. If you look at the end of the book, book of Revelation, final book in all of scripture, the nations are, are coming to the Lord, where his throne is established, where Jesus is, where the Father is, where the Spirit is, where the Bride is, the nations are coming. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You'll break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel where they practice wickedness. You'll, you'll break that and you'll establish righteousness. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve Yahweh, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, this messianic anointed son that's coming. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. So the first two Psalms, God is going to establish righteousness, break wickedness, but he's going to establish it through the Messiah, his son, his king. The kingship of the Lord will establish righteousness and break wickedness. And then the Psalms proceed now all the way from Psalm 1 and 2 through to Psalm 150 with this theme, this premise, this process, this principle in order. God's king. Now, when, when, when we begin to look through the Psalms, all the Psalms have this idea of kingship moving through the first three books. And the king is an earthly king. Psalm number one, the majority of the Psalms are attributed to David, or uh, book number one, which is Psalm 1 through Psalm 41. The majority of the Psalms are attributed to David. In book two, which runs uh, 42 through 72. The majority of the Psalms are about David. It's about this earthly ruler, how God is going to use David, the man after God's own heart, and establish his promises to this human ruler who, who seeks after God, who seeks righteousness, who seeks justice. The Psalms are predominantly written by David. Most of the Psalms in the first three books, actually, particularly the first two, are Psalms of lament. It's all the problems that David has becoming king, staying as king, being a righteous king, being a righteous king. Psalms of lament, are they dominate this establishment of his kingship. And remember, the first two books, they deal with at the seams of the books, and by the seams we mean the beginning and the end, they always talk about this righteous ruler. Here at the beginning of Psalm, Psalms 2, the righteous ruler. Where Psalm, book 1 of Psalms and Psalm 41, it's about what a righteous ruler does and how God takes care of a righteous ruler. He, he, this righteous ruler uh, uh, takes care of the poor. The Lord delivers this righteous ruler from his enemies. The Lord uh, delivers him from betrayal. The Lord uh, 
gives him victory in battle. The Lord uh, preserves his health. All of these things, God is establishing his kingdom through this earthly ruler. The, the second book of the Psalms, again, it's about now David is king now, and now this is how he stays in kingship. Book one is about how he gets into kingship. Saul is after him constantly. The people of God are, are against David, but the Lord preserves him. And then he gets into his kingship, and he still has problems once he gets in. His sons try to overthrow him. He's betrayed constantly. His own sin betrays him with, with Bathsheba. But God preserves him. And then we get to the end of the second book of the Psalms, 72, and it's dedicated to Solomon. David does everything he needed to do, and then he turns the kingship over to Solomon. Solomon is ruling and reigning. Solomon's reign starts out wonderful under David and Solomon. The kingdom extends beyond where it ever extended, but then Solomon's heart turns from the Lord. And by the time Solomon's son Rehoboam comes, Israel and Judah are split. The 10 northern tribes go with Jeroboam. The two southern tribes go to Rehoboam. And book three, the prophets are speaking. Now the prophets even begin speaking in, in book two. The sons of Korah speak of the Psalms of Zion. They're, they're, even though the David's struggling in the, the Lord's vision that he gives to the prophets, yes, the, the human ruler of my people can struggle, but Zion, Zion is in place. The temple is there. God's presence is there. God's city is there. God's priests are there. God's prophets are speaking. God's worship is taking place. The focus is that even though the earthly ruler of God's people, the king, is struggling, God is in the midst of Zion. God is in the midst of his people and he preserves it. So the prophets are constantly pointing back to Zion. Yes, we have a king, and the, the, the king is promised by God that he's going to fulfill God's purposes, but even when the king struggles, we've got the Lord. That's the point. But by the time we get to book three, book three is all prophets. Asaph, Psalm 73 through 83 are Psalms of Asaph, another prophetic leader. And then the remaining Psalms, David gets in a, a Psalm and, and, and the sons of Korah speak, also prophetic figures. Because now the kingdom has been divided. And see, when the kingdom's divided, God's people are in trouble and God's purposes are in trouble. God intends his purposes to be fulfilled by a united people, not a divided people. And so when we get to book three now, we're talking about the divided kingdom. And prophets are raised up when there's division in the church. I mean, all of those prophetic books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Hosea, Micah, all those prophetic books that go from Isaiah to Malachi through the, through the remainder of the Christian Old Testament, they're raised up because of the divided kingdom. Prophets need to speak. When God's people are divided, we don't hear clearly, we don't see clearly, we, we, we don't live righteously. Wickedness now is starting to take over. The nations of the earth can threaten us with wickedness. Division threatens us with wickedness. So Asaph is raised up and sons of Korah are raised up, but Israel is starting to falter. And it is during this time of the divided kingship that Assyria comes in and destroys the 10 northern tribes. Babylon comes in and destroys the two southern tribes. And so we come to the 89th Psalm. So go with me to the 89th Psalm. This is now, we've gone through book one. It starts with Psalm two and ends with Psalm 41, a righteous king. Book two ends with Psalm 72, what is a righteous king? 
Psalm, book three ends with Psalm 89. And notice they're always about kingship. These, these psalms at the seams, at the beginning, at the end of the book are about kingship. In Psalm 89, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. It's, it's, the title is A Moskill of Ethan the Ezraite. He is the brother of the writer of Psalm 88, Heman the Ezraite, but he's prophesying. He's, uh, Heman is associated with the sons of Korah. Ethan is Heman's brother. He's also part of the sons of Korah. The prophets are speaking and they talk about the kingship. And I mean, it's, it's a very long psalm. You see, it's 52 verses. And the first 37 verses say, the Lord promised that he would establish, the Lord promised that he would establish the kingship through David. But Psalm 89 is right at the point at book three where the kingdom ends. Israel is gone. Judah is gone, and guess what? When your people are in Assyria and your people are in Babylon, you don't have a king. You don't have an earthly king. You don't have an earthly ruler. And so Psalm 89 is the ultimate lament. First three books of the Psalm, Psalm 1 through 89, are dominated by songs of lament. Psalm 89 ends book three saying, What the heck is going on, Lord? You promised David. You you, you promised David in Psalm 2. You promised David in 2 Samuel 7. You promised David in all the Psalms. You promised David through Samuel and Nathan. You, You promised David. What's going on, Lord? Psalm 89 brings us to a, a, a difficult place, and yet scholars say this is the center of the Psalter because we're going to move from lament into praise. The, the Psalms of lament dominate the first three books, the first 89 Psalms, but we begin to move to praise and worship. And how does, in fact, the, the book of the Psalms end? <laughs> in praise. Book five is full of praise. Book four begins to focus on praise and why we're going to praise. We come to Psalm 90, which is the first psalm of book four. And Psalm 90, look at to whom Psalm 90 is attributed. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. What's what's true about Moses? Moses is before the human kingship. There's no human kingship. The Lord is king. And you see, it was Yahweh, the king, that delivered his oppressed people from slavery in Egypt with a mighty arm and an outstretched hand, delivered them from the most powerful political entity in human history at that time, delivered them, crushed wickedness, established righteousness, brought his people out of slavery in to the land with not a human ruler, but with the Lord being king. Now what what Jan read today, Psalm 97, right in the center of book four, it's all about the Lord being king. Psalm 89 says, what is going on, Lord? David's gone, Solomon's gone. The few righteous kings that there were, David, Solomon, Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah, Josiah, Ultimately, they failed. They they failed to bring Israel into the kingdom promises of the Lord. They failed to bring Israel into righteousness. In fact, the majority of the kings established wickedness because of their idolatry, and they led Israel into sin. Psalm 89, what the heck is going on? And in Psalm 90 through Psalm 106, which are the Psalms of Book 4, here's your answer. Now, let me me read something that... um, I'm going to read something that David Howard said in his book, The Structure of Psalms 93 to 100. Now, he, he's, in a, he's in, a, in, in a, a chapter and he's quoting all these scholars of the Psalms who recognize that there's this shift in, from Psalm 90 on to the end of the book from Psalm 1 through 89. There's a shift 
But nonetheless, it's a shift that establishes what Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 set in motion. How does God's righteousness triumph? It triumphs through the Lord's king. There's a shift in it, but the king is not going to be an earthly ruler. Not any earthly ruler. Here's what Howard says. Book 4, Psalms 90 through 106, stands at the center of the Psalms, the way they've been put together for us, the, the, the book of the Psalms that we have. He says, this grouping, particularly book 4, stands as the answer to the problem posed in Psalm 89 and the apparent failure of the Davidic covenant with which books one through three are primarily concerned. It's David, 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 and the covenant I've made with David. But the covenant fails when the exile comes and Israel and Judah are forcibly removed from their land. Briefly summarized, here's what book four begins to set in motion. Here's the answer to Psalm 89. And the answer is this, the failure of man's leadership, which we see in book one through three, leads to the answer of God's kingship, God's leadership. This is, this is where the book of Psalms is taking us. Human leadership fails. God is king. And when God is king, the Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Now, we're going to start with Moses in Psalm 90, but there's, a, there's this theme that runs particularly through Psalms 93 through 100. And in 93 through 100, and basically in all book four, here's a four-part answer to what's happened to the Davidic covenant. What's happened to the earthly rulers that are supposed to bring the kingdom of God into the earth? Number one, the answer is man fails, but the Lord is king. Yahweh is king. Number two, Yahweh, the Lord, has been our refuge, our strong tower, our strength, our rock. Yahweh is our refuge, and he has been our refuge in the past, long before the kingship ever existed, that is, in the time of Moses and the Exodus. Number three, the Lord will continue to be our refuge now that the earthly kingship is gone. And number four, blessed are they who put their trust in him. And then the whole Psalter begins to change and it moves from lament to praise. It moves from lament to worship. And why does it move to worship? Because the Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Psalm 93 through 100. There are eight consecutive psalms. And if, if, if we were just to look at a, at a, a, a brief uh a brief sampling of those psalms. Look at Psalm 93. Psalm 93 starts like this. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. Psalm 93, the Lord reigns, literally in the Hebrew is, the Lord is king. Malak is the Hebrew word for to rule or to reign, and Melech is the Hebrew word for king. The Lord reigns means the Lord functions as king. Psalm 93, the Lord reigns. Psalm, so, so Psalm 93 talks about the kingship of the Lord. The kingship of the Lord uh, is furthered in Psalm 94. O oh Lord, God of redress. Most of your translations say God of 
vengeance. A few may say a better translation, God of vindication. But the Hebrew word is, see, vengeance is not what we think of it in, in our kind of our, our, our Western understanding. Vengeance in our Western understanding is we go out and we destroy our enemies. Vengeance in Hebrew is redress of wrongs. It's God going out and removing the obstacles. He destroys the obstacles that hinder his justice from being manifested in all the earth, to all the peoples of the earth, to all the nations of the earth. God redresses that by removing the obstacles. See, that's what vengeance is. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, means I will make things right. Now, there, there may be times where there are extreme manifestations of evil that need to be set aside in order for the redress to take place. The Lord breaks the power of Egypt. The Lord breaks the power of Assyria. Pastor Jan uh, shared several weeks back, Psalm 83, time of Hezekiah, the Assyrians are going to destroy Jerusalem, and they blaspheme Yahweh. They blaspheme the Lord. Your Lord, your, your God Yahweh is not going to stop the king of Assyria. The gods of all the other nations haven't. And that night, of course, 185,000 Assyrian troops sleeping are smitten with the plague, and they're gone. Sometimes redress is serious. But God in his kingship redresses wrongs. He rights wrongs. Rise up, O judge of the earth. Repay to the proud what they deserve. The kingship of the Lord. Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king over all the gods. See, we're moving from lament into praise and worship not because a human being's leadership is established, but because the Lord's kingship is established. 96, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. A new song always means God is going to do something different. When we sing a new song, it's because our Lord is establishing himself as king, which is the real meaning of Psalm number two. And how is he going to establish himself as king? He's going to send his Messiah. He's going to send Jesus to demonstrate what God's righteousness is, what God's kingdom is, what real just leadership and rulership is. You want to judge an American president, the standard is Jesus. It's not even David. It's Jesus is the standard. And any president, any king, any world ruler that doesn't follow the standard of Jesus, then they fall short. Well, well Pastor Oz, has any president ever lived up to that? That's the point. No president has. Not the former president, nor the current president. Which means if both fall short, we don't praise one and demonize the other. We pray for our rulers and our leaders. We pray. That's going to be another key to this whole shift that God does here. But when we sing a new song, we're going to sing a new song. We're going to sing to Yahweh, all the earth. We're going to sing to the Lord. We're going to bless his name. We're going to tell of his salvation from day to day. We're going to declare his glory among the nations. In Psalm 96, Psalm 96, he's coming. The Lord is coming. And the way he's coming, Psalm 96 announces at the end, verse 11, let the heavens be glad, let the earth rejoice. God's people, the heavens, the nations of the world, the earth. Let the heavens be glad, let the earth rejoice, let the sea roar and all that fills it, let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming. What's the new song? The king is coming. That's the new song. The king is coming. 
97. The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. Jan shared it today. It's the kingship of God. He appears. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. That mountains stand for human political structures of power. Well, they're going to melt when the Lord comes to establish his mountain. The heavens proclaim his righteousness. All the people see his glory. Verse 6, manifestation, a tangible revelation, manifestation of the Lord. Idolatry is put down in verse 7. The nations see this, but so does God's people. God's people are addressed from verse 8 on the nations of the earth up to verse 6, verse 7, idolatry, both are being dealt with. See, when the Lord comes, he puts down idolatry in the nations, nationalistic sin, national idolatries. He puts those things down, but he also deals with idolatry in the church. Zion will be established. And as my wife said, Light is sown for the righteous. You don't sow light, you sow seeds. <laughs> light is revealed, you don't sow it, but you do it in God's kingdom. When the Lord comes and establishes his kingship, light is sown. And see, light is sown for the righteous, and when light is sown for the righteous, going back to Psalm 1, God wants his people to be righteous in the midst of his coming, in the midst of establishing his kingship. When light is sown, then joy comes for the upright in heart. He mentions the righteous again. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks to his holy name. It's the manifestation of his holiness, his otherness. Now, I want to point out something to you. One of the key terms that runs through the Psalms, it, this term is used more in the Psalms than anywhere else in the Old Testament, and it's used a lot anywhere else in the Old Testament, is chesed, his steadfast love. And when the Lord manifests his steadfast love, he establishes his people in his grace, in his truth, in his righteousness, and in his justice. See, those, those words, righteousness, justice, steadfast love, and faithfulness dominate the Psalms and dominate the kingship of the Lord and dominate the coming of the Lord as he establishes his kingdom. Righteousness means the Lord comes and delivers his people from their enemies and from all the hindrances of wickedness. Righteousness has first to do with God delivering his people. And when he delivers us, he makes us deliverers. Now, you have to understand this is what mission is. God's purpose is for all the nations of the earth to be blessed. How is he going to bless all the nations of the earth? Through his church. His church, his people must rise up he delivers us in his righteousness and makes us deliverers of others as we embrace his righteousness. Second word that dominates is justice. Justice is God giving equal access to his blessing to all the peoples of the earth. See, this is the job of the church. Justice is the job of the church. We are to give all all people, access to God's blessing. The church is supposed to be a blessing factory, a blessing machinery, not an idol factory, not a sectarian factory, not a factory of, well, th these are my own desires. We're to be a factory, a source of God's justice. And just his justice is the fact that he wants to bless everyone. So as the church receives blessing from the Lord and gets transformed, then we become dispensers of that blessing to all the nations, to all the peoples. We, we, we bless, we give access to the blessing of the Lord, rich and poor, white people, people of color, people who are educated, people who are struggling, people who have great health and power, people who don't have health and power. We become an axis of blessing. We become an axis of blessing to Democrats and Republicans. Oh, that's heresy, Pastor Oz. No, we're to do that. And we become a source of intercessory prayer for Republican or Democratic presidents or whoever is in the presidency. Justice. The third word is steadfast love. Steadfast love is 
the fact that God is loyal to his people. God loves his people. God gives grace to his people. Steadfast love is the foundation of God's throne and God's kingdom purposes and the church. And as we walk in his steadfast love, we experience that love, that faithfulness, that covenant loyalty, that when he promises things to us, he fulfills it. And then we become people of our word and we manifest his word to others. We distribute the steadfast love. We, be, we impart the steadfast love to others. Fourth word is faithfulness. And faithfulness is truth. Amet and Amenu. God's faithfulness is that he, he is true. We beheld his glory full of grace and truth, steadfast love and faithfulness. See, grace and truth in the New Testament, which we see coming through Jesus, John chapter 1, we beheld his glory full of grace and truth, is chesed and amet. It's, just the, it's, it's parallel from the Old Testament, steadfast love and Truth is grace and truth in the New Testament. And he, he deals with truth. Now, God deals with the world differently from the way he deals with the church. God blesses the nations of the earth even in their foolishness, even in their unrighteousness, even when, when, when they don't understand his word or they, they misunderstand his word. The church, on the other hand, God deals with the church according to truth. We are called to understand his truth, to embrace his truth, to believe in his truth, to live in his truth, to walk in his truth, to minister in his truth. Now, verse 10 of Psalm 97 says, O oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. Jan quoted that. He preserves the life of his saints. Hased is steadfast love. His saints are his Hasids, his Hased ones. Those who walk in his steadfast love are his saints. That's what it means to be a saint. That's what it means to be a, 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 a holy one of the Lord. There, there are two different words for saints. Um, uh, one one is to be a, a stead one who walks in his steadfast love. The other is one who's set apart in his holiness, his otherness, his awesomeness, his wonder, wonder accomplishing power, wonder working power. That's Psalm ninety seven. Psalm ninety eight. Sing to the Lord a new song. Verse one again. Second time we're dealing with a new song, and that new song. Uh, is in verse four, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in a joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre, with the sound of the melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise, noise before the King, the Lord. Verse nine, before the Lord, for he comes to judge earth. See, he's coming in Psalm 96, he's coming in Psalm 98. What's he coming in? As king. The king is coming. And as we await his coming, we are to be ambassadors of his presence. We are to declare his kingship in the earth. Before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth, he will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. We're back to righteousness the same righteousness of the king in Psalms 1 and 2. But now it, we're moving from lament. The f and, and we lament because human rulers fail us. And we praise because the Lord is the ultimate ruler, the king of all the earth, and he will never fail us. Now, let's, let's just look at this hour right now. We are seeing massive failure of human leadership. Our political leaders have failed us. Our economic leaders have failed us. Our scientific leaders are confused. 
oh, this is what COVID-19 means. This is what COVID-19 means. No, here's what COVID-19 means. We're confused. We don't know what's going on. Wear masks. Don't wear masks. Oh, it's not so bad. Oh, it's horrible. The vaccination's going to work. Don't take the vaccination. This vaccination worked, but oh, now there's a new strain coming out. It might not work. Our scientific leaders, our economic leaders, our political leaders have failed us. And brethren, our, lead, our religious leaders have failed us. The church, the leaders in the church have failed us. And all I have to say is take a look at the division in the body of Christ. Our religious leaders have failed us, but the Lord will not fail us. Sing a new song. The basis of movement from lament to praise is the Lord is king. And brethren, we need to understand the failure of man's leadership in books one through three leads to the eschatological answer of God's kingship in books four and five. He's the answer. Jesus is the answer. Psalm 99, the Lord reigns, let the, let the, the, the peoples tremble. Psalm 99 has this theme about the holiness of the Lord. Verse three, let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is it, your name is holy. And then it says, the king in his might loves justice. You have established an equity, or equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is it. His name is holy. His footstool is holy. What's his footstool? Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. God's footstool, he places his feet in the temple. He places his feet in the land of Israel. He places his feet in the church. His name is holy. His people are holy. And finally... The last verse, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. His mountain is holy. The place of his presence is holy. For the Lord our God, he is holy. His name is holy. That His name is his, his, his attributes, his character traits. Who he is is holy. His footstool, his people are holy. His mountain is holy. The place of where his presence comes into the church is holy. He is holy. The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. A holy God is coming. And when a holy God is coming, he separates wickedness from righteousness. He separates tares from wheat. And finally, we end up in Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. You know the amazing thing he says here? We understand that God's people are the sheep of his pasture. And all through Psalm, uh, all through book three in particular, there's this emphasis on, the, the, on, on how the Lord is the shepherd who's going to lead his people. Even as the kingship is starting to fail in book three, when Israel and Judah are divided, the, the great shepherd of the sheep comes and he goes and he finds all the lost sheep and he brings them back to himself. And Jesus said he's the good shepherd. In John 10, he's our shepherd. But Psalm 100 is amazing. He's not just the shepherd of Israel. Let the whole earth rejoice. He's going to shepherd the whole earth. He's going to shepherd all the nations of the earth. The Lord is going to establish his kingdom in the earth. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for his steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Now, a couple more points as, as we move we move through book four. Book four, the kingship of the Lord is established in the earth. Do we need human rulers and leaders? Well, book four is going to give us a suggestion to what kind of leader we need when, when the Lord is, is saying all the rulers of the earth have failed and he's going to establish his kingship. We're, we're going we're gonna to need those kind of leaders and rulers, but I want you to see how book five moves toward this ultimate conclusion of this explosion of praise. The last five Psalms, 146, 147, 148, 149, and 150, 
uh, is this explosiveness of praise and worship. All of book five is there's all this smattering of worship and 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 keeping the word of the Lord and 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 the presence of God. It's 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 as if in book five, book five takes all the positive things that are in books one, two, three, and four, and establishes them through the kingship of the Lord in the earth. Now, remember what Psalm 2 was all about. It's about the Lord bringing the kings of the earth who rebel against the Lord and against his Messiah. How do the nations of the earth rebel against the Lord and against his Messiah? They rebel against the Lord and against his Messiah because they want to establish their own authority. See, where leadership goes right is when it walks in the authority of justice, the authority of righteousness, the authority of mercy, the authority of caring for all people, all people having access to blessing, the vulnerable cared for, the righteous exalted, the wicked disestablished broken. God looks at worldly leadership based on how they follow his word, whether they're Christian or not. It's his word, but they're human beings. All human beings are made in the image and the likeness of the Lord. And that means we all have within us this sense of right and wrong, this sense of morality and immorality. And it's a war but the kingdoms of the earth are supposed to do that. And when the kingdoms of the earth don't do it, Psalm 2 says the Son of God is going to take his scepter and he's going to crush the power of that earthly nation. The church needs to be in the middle of this with a prophetic voice pointing the nations toward that. But that's Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, righteousness and wickedness. And the Messiah is going to establish his kingdom and bring down everything that opposes it. Look at Psalm 149. Psalm 149 is the second to last psalm. And it's, it has a parallel conceptual structure to the second psalm. The second psalm and the second to last psalm, Psalm 2 and Psalm 149 say, they're, they're, they're bookends. They're the inclusio. They're saying everything between Psalm 1 and Psalm 150 is about Psalm 2 and Psalm 149. Look at what, Psalm 149. Now, here's an interesting thing about Psalm 149. Three times, three times in Psalm 149, the word chasid is used. That's a chesed one, the saints. The saints are, 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 are the stars of Psalm 149. They're the heroes of Psalm 149. And this is showing us something of how God's kingship works. When God's kingship works in the earth, God's kingship forms a godly people, followers of Jesus, disciples, servants of Christ, Christ followers. When the kingship of the Lord is truly at work, the Lord raises up an apostolic church. He raises up a church that follows him. He raises up a church that walks in righteousness and justice and steadfast love and faithfulness and truth and then ministers that to the peoples of the world and the nations of the world. Ministers it to the peoples of the world and declares it to the nations of the world. This is what it means that we, we proclaim the gospel it's good news. The king has come, and he's come with his grace. He's come with his righteousness. He's come with his steadfast love. He's come with his justice. He's come with his blessing. He's come, and now he's calling everybody into the kingdom. Whosoever has an ear to hear, let him hear. But now, where the king was the hero in books one, two, and three of Psalms, and that hero failed miserably until the Lord established his kingship. The saints are the heroes at the end. The, the chesed ones, the ones who are exercised in his steadfast love, those exercised in chesed become chasids. They become 
the chesed ones, the ones who embody his grace and his truth. Watch. Praise the Lord, Psalm 149. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the chassids, of the saints. Let Israel be glad in his maker and let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. We see the worship, we see the praise, no lament here, worship and praise, singing unto the Lord a new song, just like we saw in Psalm 96, Psalm 98, Psalm 40, the new song. God's doing something new. He's establishing his kingdom in the earth and God's people worshiping and praising are the sign that God is doing a new thing. Israel is glad in their maker. The maker goes back to Genesis 1. The creator of all the universe now is creating his purposes in human history. He created the earth. He set it in motion. Man sinned, but God had a solution. He sent his son. He sent his king. And now he's remaking the new heavens and the new earth. He's the maker. Let the children of Zion, the children who are walking in his presence, let them rejoice in who? Their king. Not their worldly leaders, not their spiritual leaders, not their economic leaders, not their political leaders, their king, the Lord. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with the tambourine and the lyre, just like in Psalm 97. For Yahweh, the Lord, takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. We're moving from the exalted king who fails, Israel who's broken, everyone who gets humbled, including the nations of the earth, and the Lord adorns the humble with his salvation. And remember in Hebrew, the Hebrew word for salvation is Yeshua. He adorns the people with his Yeshua. He takes pleasure. This is my beloved son, the son of my love in whom I'm well pleased. I am well pleased. Let the godly, again, it's let the hesed ones, let the saints, verse five, the chesed ones exalt in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their throats. Now listen to this. High praise becomes a weapon of spiritual warfare and two-edged swords in their hands to do what? To execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the divinely decreed judgment that has been written. That's Psalm 2. Psalm 2, the Messiah says, kings of the earth, those of you who are opposing my righteousness and establishing my wickedness in the earth. I'm sending my son. He's going to bring his scepter and he's going to bring you into order. That's how the kingdom is going to be established. And at, in Psalm 149, wh where's the king? Where's the Messiah? It's his people. It's his people. See, this is Daniel 7. The Son of Man gets a kingdom, and he gives that kingdom to the saints of the Most High. We are called as the church to Finish the mission that Jesus started. What mission did Jesus start? Establishing the kingship of the Lord in the earth. What mission are we to finish? Establishing the kingship of the Lord in the earth. What is that called? Discipleship, preaching the gospel, living the gospel, becoming the church. And when we do that, the Lord not only puts the nations under his feet, but he puts the nations under our feet. And, 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 and again, what I'm trying to say by this is, is, is righteousness, what it means for the nations to be put under our feet doesn't necessarily mean that, that the, the president of a nation or the king of a nation is going to be a Christian. 
It simply means, it simply means that righteousness, justice, steadfast love, truth are manifested in the earth through the church and the nations go along with it. This is honor for all his saints. Praise the Lord. Now, are we getting a picture of how God does this? All right, a couple more points to make. Are you saying, Pastor Oz, we don't need any kind of leadership and I'm going to do something here? I lost my phone over here and I'm carrying it. I just want to see what time it is. We've got a few more minutes here to finish up. All right, it's a dangerous thing for me to start my message without my clock, without, without time in front of me. So what is Psalm 90 going to tell us? Psalm 90 is going to say leadership is still needed in the church, but it's the leadership of Moses. And then David's going to chime in and say, yeah, I, I agree with the leadership of Moses too. The prayer of Moses, the man of God, Psalm 90 Moses is an apostolic leader before there were any kings in Israel. The Lord still needs apostolic leaders. What do apostolic leaders do? Well, let's read through Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place for all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. For any mountains were in the world, before there were human political rulership in the world, the Lord was king. The Lord ruled and reigned. The Lord was our dwelling place, our refuge. You return man to the dust and say, return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight, are but as yesterday when it's past or as a watch in the night. I computed that if 70 to 80 years is a human generation, then anywhere from 12 to 14 generations, and 70 to 80 years, it's one generation is born and, and that same generation dies. 12 to 14 generations, a thousand years is like a night watch for the Lord. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning, it flourishes and is renewed, and in the evening, it fades and withers. We're, what's being compared is the, the frailty of man, the transience of man, the weakness of man, the failure of man with the eternal glory of the Lord kingship of Yahweh that Moses saw. Remember, and I, I, I spoke about this last week. In Numbers 12, verse 6, as well as in Exodus 33, Numbers 12, 6, Exodus 33, the Lord said, I speak to Moses face to face. And not like these other prophets who, who yeah, they get dreams, they get visions. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak to him face to face. Face-to-face -face in the Hebrew really means eye-to-eye, mouth-to-mouth, -to -mouth because the Lord says at one point in Exodus 33, you can't see my face, but then he says, but, but, you, but I speak to you with my face. It means that the face of the Lord, as powerful and as mighty and as awesome as it is, the Lord never reveals the fullness of his face to any one single man, even Moses, the greatest of all prophets. I mean, they're... they're, they're prophets and apostles right now, and I quotation marks, they call themselves apostles, apostles and prophets. Revelation 2 says you, you, you test those who say they're apostles and find them not to be, and you may tolerate those who call themselves prophets for a time and a season, but don't tolerate those who are false prophets. They act as if they see the fullness of the Lord. No one sees the fullness of the Lord. Moses is the top of the pecking order, guys. You shall not see my face and live. Yet I speak to you face to face. You see part of my face. No individual human being sees it all, 
save one, Jesus. The Son, the unique Son, Gospel of John chapter 1, who's in the bosom of the Father. The Father has revealed his fullness to him and him alone. It's Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit. They see it completely and fully. The rest of us, even Moses, only see a part. You know, no one Christian denomination sees the fullness. Each one sees part. See, we need one another to see the fullness. See, that, that's, the Lord has a fail-safe built in. We are frail, transient, foolish, weak, disobedient creatures. Nobody sees the fullness of the Lord. But we all see part of it. And see, this is why we need each other. I, 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 I hope if I have a chance in the, in the future, one of these Sunday messages, just to lay this out. But let me say it to you now. We all need one another. Okay? Now, I, 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 I threw that fear out. Well, 25 million voted for Trump. 25 million, 25 million Christians voted for Trump. 25 million voted against him. I was just throwing it out and saying there were a lot on both sides. More accurately... If everybody who registered as a Christian voted for Trump or Biden, if everyone voted and um, they voted based on the percentages that they declared that they were Christian voters, not everybody who says they're a Christian is a Christian. Yeah, there were over 50 million who voted for Trump, over 40 million who voted for Biden. We need each other. This idea, hey, you, you know, the one more Christians voted for Trump than Biden. They're right and the, the few are wrong. What is this? Is this American Idol? Do you think, is, show me anywhere where numbers voting follow anything in Scripture. The one, whoever, oh, okay, we're going to vote on the Ten Commandments and the ones that get the most vote are in and the ones that get the most vote are out. That's foolishness. The point I'm making is a lot of people voted for both presidents. We need each other because nobody gets it all right. I'll have to apparently prove that point to you at some other time. But back to Psalm 90. For we are brought to an end by your anger, verse 7. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. Not only are we frail, we're sinful. And because we're sinful, by truth, on the basis of truth, you would destroy us because of our sin. The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away like a bird. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to your fear? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. We, we've got to somehow... Psalm 90, book four. We got to look at things differently. We've got to change our way of thinking. We've got to change our theology from books one, two, and three. And how do we change our theology? The next verse then, this is the prayer of Moses, the man of God. Psalm 90, the superscription, the heading of the psalm is the prayer of Moses, the man of God. Moses prays for what he prays for in verses 13 on because of the first 12 verses. This is what Moses prayed. Return, O Lord. Turn back to us, Lord. The Lord has turned away from us. Now turn back to us, O Lord. How long have pity on your servants? Hebrew word, naham. It means to feel sorry, to feel pity, to feel compassion on someone and so change your mind. It means to, to it means literally to show compassion, to show pity. But the Hebrew verb tense here, when it's in that particular 
verb tense. It means when you show pity and you show compassion, you change your mind. This is a direct reference to Moses' intercessory prayer. Now, we don't have time to look at it. I did teach it in a Wednesday night Bible study this past week. Exodus 32, 33, 34. If you want to go back and look at Exodus 32, 33, and 34, that's what this prayer model is based on. Moses goes up to the mountain to get the commandments, to, to hear the word of the Lord, to, to enter into a covenant relationship with the Lord. You have the covenant of David, you have the covenant of Moses. The people are down uh, on the, underneath the mountain waiting for Moses to come back. We know the story. Moses has gone 40 days and 40 nights. I always say the origin of conspiracy theories is at the base of the mountain uh, in, in Exodus 19 and Exodus 32 where they said, God put Moses to death. He went up there to talk to the Lord. He ain't coming back. Uh, and what do human beings do when God's plans? These are, these are Christians. These are Jews. What, what do God's people do when their, their plans don't work out the way they think God should establish the kingdom? We just go back to the familiar. And what's the familiar? Egypt. We need a God to take care of us. Moses is dead. He's up there with that God. Let's go back to the familiar gods we served when we were slaves in Egypt. And of course, Aaron builds a golden calf. So because they're in the middle of nowhere, they've lost their leader. They, they've lost their God. They've formulated a whole conspiracy theory based on a potential truth. The Lord says, he's up there with Moses. He says, you see what they're doing? Yeah, they're, 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 they're sinning. They're, they're rebelling against you, Lord. They, they built a golden calf. What is going on? The Lord says, my anger my wrath. See, that's those first 11 verses of Psalm 90. They failed. And God is angry with their sin. He says, listen, Moses, get back down there. I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to destroy them. And it's interesting, the language is, your people are doing this. <laughs> your people are sinning. Now, now you... Go down there and let them know I'm going to destroy them, but I'll start all over with you. The Lord calls them your people, Moses, because they're just like you. you. You're a screw-up, they're a screw-up. I'm tired of all this. And Moses says, please, Lord, have pity on your people. Have compassion on your people, your inheritance. They're not my people, they're your people. They're not my inheritance, they're your inheritance. And he says in Psalm 32, please change your mind, O God, and be merciful. And he uses the word naham. Relent, Lord, change your mind. And in Psalm 32, God changes his mind. He changes his mind and he says, okay, Moses. I'll pardon their sin. Now, there are some consequences for their sin, but I'll pardon their sin. I'll forgive their iniquity. And the same thing happens in, in Exodus 33. Moses goes out outside the camp, and Moses has a little tent, and the Lord meets with Moses, and it says he speaks to him face to face. Joshua, who's Moses' protege, runs to the tent whenever Moses goes to the tent because he wants to get in. When Moses is hearing from God, he wants to get in with God. See, that's a real disciple. That's a father-son relationship. Do you know how many people have called me spiritual father in, in my life? Do you know how few really are spiritual sons? See, see, when a leader goes outside the camp and goes to where the Lord is, a real spiritual son follows. Doesn't make up his own terms and says, oh, the spiritual father failed. He's outside the camp. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to establish something in the camp. I'm going to start my own church here. <clears throat> but Moses says to the Lord, okay, Lord, now listen, Lord, you said earlier in Exodus that you were going to pitch your tent in the midst of your people. Now you're, you're still, you said you're going to forgive them, but we need more than forgiveness here, Lord. You're outside the tent with me, outside the camp, who are you going to send with me, Lord? Now, he said earlier he's going to send his angel. That's not what he meant. He meant, Lord, are you going to go with us? 
And that's the whole point of when Moses begins to pray at the end of chapter 33, reveal your glory to me, Lord, show me your glory. Reveal yourself to me. I want to see your glory if your glory doesn't come in our midst, Lord. See, for Moses to say, show me your glory, he's not saying, I just want to see your glory and, and so I can write books and, and go on the satellite network and be this big apostle who walks around, these big apostles and prophets, so-called New Testament apostles and prophets, walk around like there's some Old Testament demigod. Do you understand the, the, the apostle and prophet of our faith has come, Jesus. He's the only one who walks around like he's somebody. The rest of us say, Lord. See, this is, Moses shows what a real apostle's heart is. Show me your glory doesn't mean let me see your glory. It's, are you going to come back and pitch your tent in the midst of your people? Change your mind, Lord. Come back. Declare your glory. This is what Moses is praying for. This is the leadership. This is apostolic, prophetic leadership. Not look at me, I'm somebody. Not look how powerful I am and I hear God and I move in signs and wonders. Old Testament, if we want to talk about a difference between Old Testament and New Testament, the form of the ministry is different because Messiah has come and we're all a point to him. In the Old Testament, Moses being this big gun, this big shot, is pointing forward to what Jesus is going to be. Now that Jesus has come and he is all those things, none of us have to be those things. What is real New Testament apostolic and prophetic leadership right now in this hour where leaders are being disqualified left and right? Lord, change your mind. Lord, your church is hopelessly divided right now. Please change your mind. Lord, we're in the midst of this plague, which plagues are signs that, that we're not seeking your kingship and lordship. Lord, heal us, change your mind. Lord, our nation is so divided. I mean, the church is divided. Our nation is so divided. Lord, please change your mind about our nation. Will, will, will you change your mind? Will you, will you show your mercy and your compassion? Please, Lord, change your mind. And you know, the Lord will say, oh, I, I will change my mind about the nation if the church changes their mind about each other. See, see this thing about, oh, if, if Trump and the Republicans aren't in the presidency, the world, the United States is going to fail. The, the other side, oh, if, if our candidate isn't with, with, with to bring social justice, isn't in, in power, the world's going down the tubes. And the Lord says, no. If my church doesn't get their act together, the nation's going down the tubes. Moses is saying, please, Lord, bring your presence. This, this tent that I have with you outside the camp, I mean, that's, that's a pretty good thing for me. I, I, I can go in your presence anytime you want, but please bring it back into the camp because remember, Lord, Psalm 149, Psalm 2, it's going to start with your kingship, but all of us, we need to come together and be part of your disciples who establish your kingship with your presence in our midst. Now, you know what happens then in Psalm, or in Exodus 34, the Lord says, good idea, Moses, I like your idea. Now, I'm going to come before you, Exodus 34, and I'm going to proclaim the name of the Lord to you. I'm going to reveal myself. You want to see my glory? Here's my glory. I, I Just keep your finger in Psalm 90 because we're going to close it, but just please look at, we have to look at Exodus 34. We, 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 we can't get this right if we don't see Exodus 34. Here's what happens in Exodus 34. Exodus 34, verse 4. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first. Remember, when Moses came down and saw the people sinning, he broke the tablets with the Ten Commandments. You want to understand a good principle about the Lord? He's the God of the second chance. Even when we screw up the first time and we break, God destroys and breaks something or or, or the, the pastor destroys something or breaks something, he's the God of the second chance. 
bring two more tablets of stone. We'll start all over again with this, Moses. Bring the two tablets of stone like the first. And Moses rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand two tablets of stone. Okay, this is Exodus 34. We're in verse five. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Remember we said in, um, uh, it was, uh, what Psalm number was it? Uh, Psalm 99, his name is holy. Well, the Lord, to say his name is holy means the Lord reveals exactly who he is. It's a revelation of his person. See, when Moses says, show me your glory, it's the revelation of who God is. And so the Lord proclaims the name of the Lord. The Lord passed by him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and all those things are positive. He's the God of compassion, but he's also the God of strict justice. He also adds, and you, you, we have to understand this is who God is. He redresses wrong and he pardons sin. He pardons sin and he redresses wrong. See, when people persist in wrong, even when Yahweh comes, even when Yahweh comes to forgive, well, Yahweh's got to redress that wrong. When, when, when people are hindering the justice, the righteousness, the steadfast love, the faithfulness, the blessing of the Lord from being manifested. Well, he forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So he reveals his glory, and what does Moses do? He prays. He prays. See, at every point, Moses prays. We're coming close to that end here, and we're coming close to the end of the power, too. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped, and he said, If now I've found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us. See, Moses is not happy with just seeing God for himself. If you're happy just for seeing God for yourself, you ain't Moses. If you're happy just seeing God for your family, you ain't Moses. If you're just happy seeing God for your tribe, you're not Moses. If you're just happy with seeing God for your little group of Christianity, you're not Moses. If you're just happy seeing the Republican Jesus's goals established, you ain't Moses. If you have no mercy for the Republicans and you just want to see the Democratic Jesus' goals established, you ain't Moses. Moses is not happy with just himself or his own tribe. He says, if now I found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us. Lord, bring your tent back into the midst of all of your people, for it is a stiff-necked people. And so he hones in on this attribute. I mean, there are a lot of attributes there. You know, actually, it's from that passage there in Exodus 34, um, 6 and 7, where the Lord declares who he is. That's where the, the Jews get their 13 attributes of God. 13 attributes of the Lord come all from that. There, there are 13 there, and they're counted a little bit differently, but there are 13 there, but he emphasizes this one, and pardon our iniquity in, and sin, and take us for your inheritance. Pardon our iniquity and our sin. So back to Psalm 90, and we close. Return, O Lord, Psalm 90, 13. This is the prayer of Moses. Return, O Lord, how long? How long? Turn back to us, Lord. How long will you remain outside the camp, Lord? Have pity on your servants. Show compassion and change your mind, Lord. Come on back in the camp, Lord. 
Now notice, what does he refer to here in this psalm? Exodus 34. Satisfy us in the morning. Remember Moses went up on the mountain in the morning. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. And he hones in on the steadfast love of the Lord, not the punishing God, the compassionate God. He is the compassionate and punishing God. Compassionate, he shows mercy. Punishing God, he redresses injustice in the earth. But the prayer of Moses in Psalm 90 focuses in on the one that says, we are a stiff-necked people, Lord, please come back in our midst. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. See, brother, this is where we are at right now. Psalm 90. At this turn from the failed leadership of man. Failed political, failed economic, failed social, failed scientific, failed religious, failed Christian leadership. It's failed. At this turning point, we cry out to God's kingship to be established in the earth as book four of the Psalms has shown us. And we ask the Lord, the compassionate God, to come back in our midst in the church. The church, this isn't going to begin with America redoing itself. The church has to redo itself right now. And the Lord has brought us to this place. The Lord, the Lord is the one who's behind abject human failure because that's always the prelude for the establishment of his kingship. And if there are enough people of God who can rise up and begin the road back to unity in the church, to seeing the gospel in the church, to proclaiming it, to living it, the Lord will move powerfully and mightily in our midst. And look, notice what happens when his steadfast love comes in. And there's, there's no talk about punishing the iniquity. It's steadfast love. That's the prayer of Moses. That we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us. And for as many years as we have seen evil. This is, this is where we are right now. Make us glad. As, many, as much affliction that we've gone through, give us gladness, Lord. As much as evil that we've seen, wickedness, give us your righteousness, Lord. Deliver us. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. See, we have to see God's work first. That's his kingship. We have to see him establish his kingship so that his glorious power will be demonstrated. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. How is the work of our hands established? When we see the work of his hands. So is there a necessity for apostolic leadership at this time, even in the midst of the failure of Christian leadership and the division in the church shows the failure of Christian leadership. Our, the fact that we have greater solidarity to political parties and political candidates, that's a failure of leadership. I'm gonna close with this. I, 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 we're there, we're, we're there right now. I asked the Lord, I said, what's wrong with your people? And the Lord said to me, my people don't know how to think. I said, Lord, well, why don't your people know how to think? And the Lord said, because my leaders in the church have not taught them how to think. And I said, well, 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 why haven't the leaders in your church taught them to think? Because my leaders don't know how to think. And I didn't have to answer, ask the fourth question, why don't they know? Jesus said, blessed are those who hear the word and do it. So is there a type of leadership necessary in this hour? Yes, Moses, the prayer of Moses, the man of God, we need to be crying out to the Lord, change your mind, Lord, about the church. Change your mind about this nation, Lord. Change your mind about your people, Lord. Change your mind about 
what is going on in the earth right now. Change your mind, oh God, and reveal your steadfast love. That's apostolic leadership in this hour. That's the kind of leadership we need. Praying, interceding leaders. Leaders who are divested of, oh, I want to be somebody. That's why, that's why for me, I, and I've been saying this for years leading up to this, this desire to be somebody is going to destroy the church. We're there, brethren. See, you... You need selfless leaders like Moses who say, no, I don't care that I've seen your glory. Please let the, your people see your glory. I don't care that I've got this little nice little tent where I can go with you and speak face to face. I want all of God's people come on back into the midst of your church and dwell in the midst of your church. A leader... I don't care how holy, righteous, anointed, prophetic he is or she is. If God does not dwell in the midst of his people, that leader is just living an old covenant kind of reality. The person by himself or herself waiting for Jesus to come. Clue, spoiler alert, Jesus has already come. Father God, move us from lament into praise. Move us from failure into kingdom glory. Move us away from trusting in human leadership to establishing the kingship of God in our midst. Grant this unto us, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen.